Away we go. equations talked about these allele frequencies, P and Q. We're on page 292. P and Q are numbers that you can figure out these numbers about a population. You can figure out what the allele frequencies are for different genes. Are you all with me here? Some I'm thinking aren't with me. These numbers can tell you a lot about evolution. If these numbers change over time, then evolution is happening in your population. If they're 0.6 and 0.4 right now, and you come back 20 years later, and they're 0.7 and 0.3, evolution has happened. We call that type of evolution microevolution. Microevolution is small changes in the gene frequencies. And it will happen for five reasons that they show in this table right here, and they talk about in your reading. And basically, Hardy Weinberg said that in order for these numbers to stay the same, five conditions must be met. For these numbers to stay the same year after year, five conditions must be met. First of all, there has to be random mating. See up at the top of this chart? <coughs> if preferential mating is going on, the numbers will change. For instance, if the recessive allele is hitchhiker's thumb or the straight thumb, and it is found in the humans that straight thumb is very attractive. You like a girl with straight thumb. Well, that's preferential mating, you see. If only the straight thumb girls are having kids, and the, the hitchhiker's thumb girls aren't having any kids, then this number is going to go up. Q is going to go up, right? Wait, this so you can't have that. Wait, what is this? about like is this if evolution is occurring or not occurring? In order for evolu in order for these numbers to stay the same, okay. in order for there to be oh. no evolution. So for the equi equilibrium thing? Yes, okay. to, to remain and that's what we call it. We say to to remain in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. <laughs> Get the hyphen. Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. In order to maintain Hardy Weinberg equilibrium in order for these numbers to stay the same year after year, in order for no evolution to occur, you gotta, these five things have to be met. You have to have random mating. If you're choosing your mates based on some characteristic, it'll change your numbers. It'll drive the Q up or drive the P up and drive the other one down. Yes? And why does it say like on the right evolution did occur for like four to one? If there's random mating? No, for like no selection and stuff. I don't know. Ignore that until I figure it out. But I'm telling you, if random mating is occurring, you won't get evolution. I guess it's because this is this is phrase no. So if there is selection happening evolution will occur. But if there's no selection, evolution won't occur. So what is selection? <coughs> selection is if nature is selecting organisms that survive. For instance, the long-necked giraffe 
is being selected for because it's got a long neck. It's favored, you see. That's selection. If selection is happening, that'll change the numbers. If the long neck gene is dominant and the short neck gene is recessive, and you survive better because you have a long neck, then your P is going to change. This number is going to go up. Yes? So that's kind of like if there's no necessary like environmental adaptation. That's right. If there's anything necessary that you need to change to meet your environment better, that's going to cause evolution. If there's no selection, evolution will not occur. If there's no mutation, evolution will not occur. Think of genes. If, if there's mutation where organisms are normally, let's say there's two recessive organisms. If there's a, a little a, little a organism, and he mates with a little a, little a organism, what are all the kids going to be? Little. All the kids are going to be little a, little a. But mutation is when one of the genes changes to the other form in the kid. That's a mutation. Mutation happens, that'll change your numbers a bit, you see. Mm. So you can't have any mutation if you're going to stay in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. You can't have migration either. Migration is leaving or entering a population. If you have organisms coming into the population from elsewhere, bringing in new genes, that'll change your numbers. If a bunch of recessive organisms leave your population, that will change your numbers. So you can't have any migration. And you have to have a large population, too. You can't have any genetic drift. So I'm going to talk about what this last one means, what genetic drift means. Genetic drift is random changes that happen to a population. Sometimes it's random, sometimes it's not. Changes that happen to a population, and it especially affects small populations. Like Tokyo? Let me show you an example of genetic drift. Let's say we have a tiny population of frogs here. We got green frogs and brown frogs. And right here, originally, brown frogs make up 10% of the population. One out of 10 of these frogs are brown. <coughs> you see it? That one. Let's say there's a natural disaster and it kills five of the green frogs. A tree falls on five of the green frogs. Jessica, you seem as if you're doing the homework right now. You're not? No? You're punching your notes on the calculator too? Well, it's an odd way of doing that. Has a keyboard on it. After you kill five green frogs, then now the population has changed. 20% of the population is brown. So the numbers have changed, you see, because of this natural disaster. We call that genetic drift. It's not always survival of the fittest, it's survival of the luckiest sometimes. Random genetic drift allows allele frequencies to change over time due to chance. The smaller a population is, the more susceptible it is to dramatic changes in allele frequencies due to genetic drift. <coughs> in small populations, genetic drift favors a relatively rapid loss of alleles, leading to one allele. Let's cut out his talking there for a minute. <coughs> think of a think of a small population of of manatees. Mm. You know, manatees. Did y'all know the manatee population is very small? Mm -hmm. There's only maybe a couple a thousand of them left or so. I don't know how many it is, but it's not many. Think if that population even got smaller and you're down to the last few individuals. And think if there's one manatee out there that's big. And he gets hit by a boat. Uh -uh. Then you've lost all the big genes from that population, you see. And that population from then on, even if the population recovers, is not going to have many of the big genes left because it's just small individuals. We call that genetic drift. 
It'll really affect a small population, but it won't really affect a large population, because if the population was thousands <coughs> of individuals, or millions of individuals, and one big one got killed, that wouldn't matter, because you got other big ones in the population, but when the population gets small, that matters. How exactly would a population recover from that if they were sick? Probably could not. Probably, once they get low enough, you know, they really have a hard time recovering. But sometimes no, they could. It just depends on the genetic diversity of the few individuals that are left. If they're really genetically diverse, maybe they could survive. Look at this. Here's this population of a bunch of different colored frogs. Let's suppose all of them died of these two. And they somehow found a new population. Well, the new population is going to look a lot different from the old population, isn't it? That often happens on islands, where a couple organisms come to an island by chance, like the Galapagos Islands, and end up on the island, and end up founding a new population. Or your 19 friends. Right. <laughs> or your 19 friends. That's the problem I gave friends? them. They're dead. Yeah, they're dead. Or they didn't make it to whatever island these things are on. How do they know they make an island? Like maybe, they, maybe they're on a log that floats so close to an island. Yeah. So this isn't survival of the fittest. It's, it's more survival of the luckiest. There's not selection going on. This is called genetic drift. Genetic drift can really change the, the way a population looks. Here's a human example. If you look at Amish, uh, is, it, is it Amish? Amish, oh. Uh. The Amish po population has a lot of polydactylism. Polydactyly is extra fingers and toes. And it's the reason why there's so many polydactylous Amish is that the original people who made up the Amish population, a couple of them were polydact had polydactyly, had the gene for extra fingers and toes. And Amish are only allowed to marry other Amish, you see. Mm -hmm. So the gene kind of stays in their population. It'd be like if I went off with 19 of my friends, like in the problem that I gave you on the worksheet, <coughs> and it just so happened that six of the 19 were real short people. We'd end up with a pretty short population if we founded a whole new population. Because you had some short people to start with. That's genetic drift. Yeah, I know some uh, Amish. It's true. They often call it the bottleneck effect. If you take a large population and you only take a few members of that population and then let them multiply, it can change your numbers pretty drastically. Here, the number of greens went way up. Originally, only 26% of the population was green. After the bottlenecking event, 44% of the population was green. Here's another example. If you have a large, diverse, original population, and you just end up, you can end up with a very different population. It's only some of your, <coughs> some of the organisms in that population. <coughs> Give me any of this stuff, Lee? Yeah. So, these are just ways that this these numbers can be affected. The, the five ways in that book, the five things if any of these five conditions are violated, you'll get evolution. Selection happens, if mutation happens, if migration happens, if genetic drift happens, <coughs> if non-random mating happens, those will all lead to evolution. What if I don't get large population? If the population is large, genetic drift isn't likely. If a tree falls on five frogs and the population of frogs is 10 million frogs, it's not going to change your numbers significantly. If a tree falls on five frogs and there are only ten frogs there, it might change your, your numbers significantly. So you, ha you need a large population to avoid genetic drift. 
Yes. There's, is this even possible? These five conditions to be met all at the same time naturally? It's not. In nature, it's not. No. no. And you know what that means? Every population is evolving right now. Every single one of them in nature. No way. It just takes a really long time. It does. Or it can take a long time. It can take a long time. Because kind of like right now, don't, don't they say that shoes are kind of um, lessening the need for, our, for like padded feet? Probably so. And our skulls used to be thicker mm -hmm. back before we had evolved. We used to be a lot hairier before we had clothes. <laughs> That's what I recall. Hair all over our bodies. Now the only hair that remains really is the top of the head. Huge extent like gorillas have. Mm -hmm. That protects us from the sun. That's one, one reason why it's there. Pretty cool. Interesting. <laughs> so that's what 16.1 talked about. Hopefully you already uh, you already read that section. You were supposed to. It was a good one. You were also supposed to have read 16.2. Also a good one. 16.2 talks just specifically about natural selection and how it happens. There's different types of selection that goes on. The type we talked about with the giraffes growing longer necks, that's called directional selection. Normally, there is a range. Have y'all ever heard of a bell curve? Mm -hmm. My this favorite. This is a bell curve, and it describes the, the range of organisms. It, there's variation amongst organisms in every population. And this bell curve talks about that range. In other words, there's some giraffes with really long necks, and some giraffes with really short necks, but most of them have medium length long necks. <laughs> uh, you know, there's some that are especially long, and there's some that are shorter, but most of them are medium, you see. And when directional selection happens, the, the bell curve shifts in one direction or another. So in this case, it shifted to the right. You see this. This bell curve has moved from the middle of this graph to the right, which means the neck length went from medium to long over time in giraffes. That's called directional selection, when, you're, when the organisms are moving in a certain direction. Horses went from small to real big. Camels went from small to real big. Glyptodonts went from big to real small. Now they're armadillo size. <laughs> Humans have gone from small to big over the time in their evolution. Humans used to be a lot smaller. If you go back far enough in the fossil record. Byron. <laughs> <laughs> Humans will continue to grow larger. Byron. Probably the thing is evolution, like you said, is slow. It ordinarily takes hundreds of thousands of years. We are now in control of our genetics, the genetic engineering, mm -hmm. and we can speed it up in any direction we want. But see, isn't that tech? But see, then you're not allowed to actually do that because it's against like. Normal. You don't think we'll ever do it? No, I think we eventually will, but um, <laughs> speed up this evolution. Speed up our own evolution. Didn't like Hitler try to do it or Stalin? Yeah, that, that was in the 30s, Dante. Yeah. Science has changed. But yeah, he did. They, he well, for instance, if you want to get rid of genetic diseases. Uh, eugenics, right? Not necessarily. No. If, if we came up with a way to remove the gene for sickle cell anemia or um, uh, uh, Huntington's disease, if we came up with a way to clip that no, DNA no. out and you could do that easily, we'd probably do it. And that would be changing human genetics through genetic engineering, and that would be evolution. You go from having these big H genes in the population to none of them, and that changes your numbers. And so we, we're probably capable of changing human evolution easier through genetic engineering than we are waiting hundreds of thousands of years through normal mating. Yeah, no means. yeah um, but yeah, we're probably still evolving. Yeah, because didn't like back you know, in the Civil War, didn't they say, I guess, like, the average height was a lot shorter. Right, yeah. Like, but a lot of that's due to the environment, the environment. Due, to, 
due to better eating and, yeah. and healthier and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of it's not, it's probably not much due to genetics. Yeah, because I read somewhere that average height can decrease when agricultural, like agricultural communities first came around because, you know, even though they could get more, it was less quality. <coughs> Sometimes of evolution happens, and sometimes the selection is when you take your your bell, your normal bell curve, and only the average organisms are favored. Only the average are favored. We call that stabilizing selection. This is true of, for a lot of things. If you look at the height of wild grass growing in a field. Have you ever noticed it's all the same? These grass plants all pretty much grow to the same height, and you look over this field, and, and all the wild grasses are about the same height. Oh, yeah. Notice that? If you're too tall, guess what happens to you? If you're a wild grass and you grow taller than everybody you're above. Eaten. You get eaten, probably. Because you're, you're taller and easier to reach for whatever's leaning down and eating. If you're too short, guess what happens? You don't, get enough yeah, light. you don't get enough sunlight. So you got to grow about average. The average is favored, you see. And this happens with a lot of population, and it ends up making a very narrow bell curve instead of a normal wide bell curve. That's called stabilizing selection. Hmm. When the average is favored. Average birth weight in humans is a favored characteristic. Babies born too big, they don't survive. They don't make it out of the mother very easily and often die in childbirth. Babies too small, they can't survive on their own after they're born. So human birth weight is a very narrow bell curve. If you were to plot it, the bell curve looks like this for human birth weight. It's not wide like this. We call it stabilizing selection. Number of eggs birds lay in their nest has been stabilized. They lay too many eggs, they can't feed all their chicks. They lay not enough eggs, you know, you're going to lose some eggs because something will come by your nest and get some of them. So you got to lay enough where they'll survive, where some will survive, but you can't lay too many, so it's been stabilized. Finally, there's what we call disruptive selection. When either, when both extremes are favored and the average one is not. Oh, here's baby birth weight, showing the graph of baby birth weight. This is infant mortality. High mortality if you're too low of a birth weight. High mortality if you're too high of a birth weight. They do best right in the middle. This shows birds' number of eggs laid. Clutch size is number of eggs laid. It's a real thin peak. Wait, how does that, how is that like genetic though? Isn't that just like? It's not genetic, well, well, if you have, a, if you have genes that say lay four eggs, no, so that you you're favored. Know. If you have genes that say lay seven eggs, you're not favored. So it is a genetic? <laughs> it is genetic. Yeah. Is it like in, the, in like the brain? It's in the DNA, not the brain. It's in the DNA of every cell. Like is there like a limit to what they can learn from that, or is it just what they naturally? Have? That's probably a limit. Hmm. I prefer twelve. Yeah, if your species is laying twelve, that's probably too many. You don't make it. Yeah. Except chickens. Here you see horse body size has gone up and up over the millions of years. This is what horses used to look like. They were the size of dogs. Here at theory. Why do your tails get bigger? Like more? I don't know. Maybe uh, get rid of insects? Knock insects off of them from bothering them? You know, well, horses have been around with humans a long time, right? Uh -huh. there, there's been a lot of breeding with horses. Yeah, that's true. But this is, this is the wild horse that they're talking about here. The thoroughbred is even way bigger. These are, um, a couple, these are called British land snails. And originally, they were of medium, most of them were of what we call medium banding pattern. Nowadays, you find two types. You find the dark kind or the light kind. There are no mediums. 
The dark kind blend in real well in the grass, and the light kind blend in real well on the beachy areas, real sandy areas. The intermediate don't survive well in either area. So we started out a long time ago, there was just a single banding pattern, kind of not, not too dark or not too light, and that has become two different species over time. This is evolution that leads to different species. We call it disruptive evolution. <coughs> Over time, the British land cells have evolved two separate snail shell colors. The book talks about sexual selection. Some traits are favored just because they're pretty to the opposite sex. And that's called sexual selection. You often see male birds with real elaborate feathers. And that doesn't really help them survive, but it helps them mate because the female chooses the male with the healthiest looking feathers. Mm -hmm. So why is this peacock so ornate? That can't help it survive in the wild. Things can see these ornate feathers. I thought it, was it helps them pick the female. I thought like the... All that stuff in the back was to make it look bigger, so things would be like scary. Uh, that could probably help it oh, okay. as a side effect, yeah. Okay. But usually, very colorful feathers. You can see how it could be a hindrance, mm -hmm. especially for a, for birds that are preyed upon by other, other things. Um, makes them easier to see, you know. But the female's going, gosh. If he survived this long with all of those feathers, he must be pretty good. Mm. He must be pretty healthy. I'll mate with him. Must be the Audubon. The, uh, the baboon is doing a display here. He's got these big teeth. And uh, the female will go for the one with most powerful display. And these, these baboons are in a hierarchy, and they'll fight with one another for uh, to see who gets to mate. The males will compete with one another. So they develop these real long teeth, and you, when you see that, you think, oh, they must have that for catching, eating meat or something like that. It's, it's not. It's more of a, it's more for sexual selection. The males compete. They have for their territories and stuff. And it's a way of showing that you're healthy and strong and mean if you have bigger teeth. They don't really use them that much. This shows, this is, the book talks about territoriality and red deer. These huge antlers are for fighting off other males for, for guarding their territory. And um, you know, they're, they're probably a hindrance growing these huge things and having to carry them around, but uh, it's good when you're trying to guard your territory to get a mate. Those things come in handy because that's how they decide that these, these little battles they have. They're not really injured in the battles, but if you have the bigger horns, you, you can hook, grapple with the other deer better and you can maintain your territory and then you can mate. If you have a big territory, you'll have some females on your territory. Sixteen point three. Complete achromatopsia is a recessive genetic disorder that causes complete color blindness. People with complete achromatopsia see no color, only shades of gray. The image above shows how a person with this form of color blindness would see the world. That is a mutation that can come about from inbreeding. Inbreeding is when you're having kids with your <coughs> relatives. And it tends to lead to su successive mutations. Uh, not mutations, but, uh, but tends to lead to... Um, lead to heterozy uh, homozygous recessives 
you know, everybody in your genome, you have these recessive genes that it's okay if you have one if you have a dominant on the other chromosome. The problem is when you get the two recessives together. And it usually doesn't happen when you're mating with other families because the, the recessive genes that are deadly are rare. But if you mate within your own family, you're likely to get the same recessive gene that your sister has, you see, and you can pass those on to your kids. So you don't want to mate within your family. And nature has taken care of that. You're automatically not attracted to your brothers or sisters usually, even if they're beautiful people. You're like, oh, I don't, my sister? No, that's gross. It's, it hurts. She's disgusting. <laughs> And your buddy's going, no, man, she's fine. And you're like, God, it's so gross. <laughs> nature builds that into you. You don't have to, because nature doesn't want you mating with your, breeding with, with your brothers and sisters. And this is, it's also built into every other animal, too. They don't normally mate with their brothers and sisters. Some do, but most don't, to avoid that. So there's an extra reading section on that, page 300 and 301. I'm kind of going through this fast. Make sure you do your reading. I can't talk about everything in a second. This shows several different subspecies of snakes. We have different types of snakes that are in Georgia here. What type of snakes are these? Uh, rat snake. Y'all ever seen one of these? Yeah, we're the green one. Yeah, we're this, this one right here. That's what the rat snakes look like around here. And there's different ones. These are the w ones down here in the Everglades, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And these are the ones over here in Alabama, southwest Georgia. And these up here, these dark ones, are up here in this blue area. These are all the same species of snakes, but they look different enough, so we call them subspecies. How do you know they're the same species? We, we consider them to be the same species if they can mate and have children, and the children can also have children. If that's the case, they're considered to be the same species. If two different organisms, like this one and this one, if they got together and made it and had babies, if the babies survive and can themselves have kids, then this one and this one are considered to be the same species. Wait, so this is like a mule can't have kids, can it? That's right. A horse can have sex with a donkey and can even have babies and you get a mule, but the mule's sterile. So a horse and a donkey are considered different species. Why is the mule, mule sterile? Uh, some to do with the chromosome numbers of the two are different. So, so like mules are gonna die out? Unless yeah, ligers, ligers. Ligers are the same way. Yeah, mules can't have kids. So the only way a mule can come about is if a horse and a donkey mate with one so another. A liger, can a liger can't have kids either. And that never really happened. All humans are the same species because if you take any two humans on the planet and made them, they can have kids, and the kids can have kids too. So all all Homo sapiens are the same species. You see? Yes. Just, we're Homo sapiens sapiens, right? Are we? I've seen it twice. That's, that's correct. Yeah. So, so sapiens is also a subspecies. There used to be other subspecies. You know. We'll talk about those when we study humans okay. after this. Wait, okay. if a human had sex with a gorilla. Then Nope, they wouldn't even have any kids. Well, what about so like humans and gorillas are different species. What about like Homo erectus? Why couldn't it? Why couldn't it? Extinct. Yeah, I know, but it's Homo erectus. What about chimps? If a human mates with a chimp or a gorilla or anything like that, the, the sperm will not even be able to fertilize the egg. It will not even be able to grow into a new... That's because... Into a human. They have different numbers of chromosomes and everything. So... Humans and gorillas, or humans and chimpanzees, are considered different species. Yeah. Mm. So why can't so, like, so they, 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 they have a 
Oh, okay. Yeah, kidding. Well, they, they can't. They're they're considered to be different species because their their babies don't survive. That's right. So wait, so could a Homo erectus and like a Homo sapiens have eight kids? Hmm. They don't know. I mean, they don't know. Oh, that's right. If a Homo erectus were still around, would they be able to? They don't know. Yeah. Wasn't the last? What, what was the last? Um, was it Lucy? Was it a Homo erectus? No, that was an Australopithecus. The last surviving hominid was uh, Neanderthal. Yeah, yeah, the Neanderthal. And they they suspect that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens could know. make and have kids. Yeah, but how did the, how did Neanderthals die out? They were supposed to be. Supposed to be they were killed by modern humans. Yeah. Probably or outcompeted. Yeah. We'll talk about that when we do human evolution. If you want to talk more about human evolution, you got to wait until after the AP exam, we're gonna spend three days on it, and I'll show you all the branches of the family tree. Yep. We are long removed from uh, apes and chimpanzees. Over seven million years of evolution has changed us so significantly that we even have different chromosome numbers than them, and uh, it can't make any offspring with them. So humans can't make any That's right. But, you see there's lots of variation in these subspecies. There have been lots of genes come up that are, have changed the organisms from place to place. So even though they can mate with one another and have kids, so they're considered the same species, there are genetic differences amongst the species. Just like there are genetic differences amongst humans. Some humans are tall, some are short. Some are white, some are black. Some mm. are smart, some aren't. I should say some are smart, some aren't. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> yes? How come um, some people are more intelligent than others? Like, why is it that you know how you said, like, there's no mixing stuff? Like, how last time we learned that it was, like, one or the other, like, either tall or short or something like that? Or was it like medium? Blending theory. Blending theory, you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. How come, and how come when, like, a black person or a white person has kids? Um, it's because of uh, what we call uh, polygenic inheritance. I don't know if you remember that. We, we, we studied it. Yeah. Where something like skin color or height doesn't have just one set of genes. It has many. So, for instance, height has several genes. All of these genes are for height. One, two, three, four, five, six sets of genes. If you get all capital letters, you're real tall. Because capital letter means tall. If you get all lowercase letters, you're real short. So what if a real tall person, Shaquille O'Neal, marries a real short person, my sister, who's four foot eight? Well, my sister's donating only lowercase letters to the egg, and Shaquille is donating only uppercase letters to the sperm, so the kids are going to end up what? What height? Really tall. Medium. Really tall? Medium. They're going to end up medium, because these are called contributing factors, and these are non-contributing factors, so the kids will end up with half contributing, the kids will end up medium height. Most human characteristics, most characteristics for any organism, are polygenic. Use a lot of genes. If you only have one set of genes, though, like the pea plant, then you're either tall or short. There's no medium in there, you see, because you only have one set of genes. But if you have several sets of genes, you can start to get mediums and such. So we call that polygenic inheritance, and most traits are polygenic, not singular chromosomes. We already learned that. We already talked about it. You, you, you just don't remember. But uh, we did go over that. <laughs> Look at this. This is a. Uh, um, oh, did I finish talking about this? Oh, yeah, okay. This is uh, the overlap showing where malaria is prevalent, the yellow. where okay. sickle cell anemia is prevalent, and where they overlap in the blue where there's both malaria and sickle cell anemia. Why is our malaria and sickle cell anemia both prevalent in the same areas? 
because sickle cell protects from malaria. That's right. If you are big ass, big ass, you're normal. That's what almost all of us are. Probably all of us are nor have a normal genotype. If you're sickle cell, you're little s, little s. You have sickle cell anemia. And that will kill you at a young age. You would know if you had that. You're tired all the time. You have all sorts of circulation problems. If you're big ass, little ass, you have what's called sickle cell trait. What's your immune to malaria? And this makes you immune to malaria somehow. It's something to do in your blood cells. But you still don't have sickle cell anemia. You don't have sickle cell anemia, and you're immune to malaria. This is like Superman. <laughs> and they can live in Africa, and they're just fine. They don't ever worry about malaria. They don't get it. Who do it now? They're the yellow and uh, no, they're the uh, they're the red. Uh, they're the blue where they, where it overlaps. Well, they're they're not. This is this graph is showing where malaria is prevalent and where sickle cell is prevalent and where the two overlap. So here's the reason why they overlap is because wherever there's a lot of malaria, you'll find a lot of these guys in any place where there's a lot of malaria. And if two of these people mate with one another. If a big ass little s marries a big ass little s, you can see they're going to have a one fourth chance of being little s little s, right? This is big s big s, and this is big s little s, and this is big s little s. This guy is going to have sickle cell. So two supermen and women could have a sickle cell kid. That's why there's the overlap. In malaria-stricken regions, there are a lot of these around because they do really well. But since there are a lot of these around, they can tend to have the sickle cell kid. And the sickle cell kid does, doesn't live for very long. Does it have a normal kid? Normal kid oh, yeah, this is a normal kid. Normal but he'll die of malaria. He'll die of malaria in that region. Wow. So these two kids will do well. And they'll be supermen, and they'll survive well in the region. And, and Maybe they'll marry somebody else that's Superman, too. So here's the, here's the thing. Even though sickle cell anemia is a terrible disease, it's going to stay in the population because having the sickle cell trait makes you even better able to live there. So you'll never get rid of sickle cell anemia. And that's what this section is about, maintaining genetic diversity. The little s gene is maintained in the population because of what we call, there's a name for this, it's called heterozygote advantage. Heterozygote advantage. In this case, the heterozygote has an advantage to their survival. And it maintains that little gene in the population. That little gene will never disappear as long as malaria is around. Now, if you get rid of malaria somehow, vaccine, vaccines or kill all the mosquitoes or something, if you get rid of malaria, then you might see that sickle cell anemia direct trait disappear over time. Are people with sickle cell anemia also in, immune to uh, malaria? I think so, but they have worse problems to worry about. Yeah, they got <laughs> I don't think they get malaria either. There's something about that sickle cell trait, it produces a protein that the malaria bug doesn't like and won't, won't be in those cells. I, I, I don't exactly know why that is. But uh, for some reason, malaria, if you, if you study malaria, which uh, we'll talk about some later, um, you'll see it's, it's kind of like a virus. It gets inside cells and it multiplies inside blood cells. Is there a vaccine yet? Or are they still working? They just, they just came out with a vaccine. Really? Oh, I've been waiting for that. I've, I've read about that. Yeah, they've been working on it like 30 years. Malaria? Oh, malaria. Wow. It's malaria vaccine. Is this like, a, like an actual proven to work? Yeah, it, well, it's, it's, uh, it's only like 80% effective. Oh, it's better than nothing. <laughs> but it's better than 0% yeah. effective. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's very good. Y'all have a good Thanksgiving. Okay. Make sure you do your reading.